red make orange. So that's, you know, that's very intuitive. People get that. Uh, well, in this game, you know, yellow is, uh, represents, you know, industry, red means politics. And when you combine those two together, you get warfare, which I think kind of works as a metaphor. And also it's, uh, you know, it, it sticks in your head. It's like, okay, if I want to make war, I need to like combine these elements. I need to focus on these things. Um, so it gives you something to go for, uh, gives you a strategy to move in the direction of, you can't do it all. And uh, the game, through various means, kind of um, suggests certain strategies. And uh, if, if one player is uh, advancing the warfare, there's always a, a counterbalancing option. Uh, you know, maybe you'll, you'll, you'll be the traitor, or maybe you'll just, you know, influence lots of regions. Uh, so there's lots of different strategies and uh, they're all viable. All right, so uh, board games recently have seen a lot of new mechanics and formats such as deck building and legacy games, uh, as well as a lot new of AR functionality and stuff. So what do you think is the most innovative new development for board games? Uh, well, are we, I guess we're just zigzagging, okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I'm really excited by the uh, potential of um, you know, computers to kind of, especially, you know, cell phones and tablets to integrate with board games in various ways. I mean, it just seems so obvious that every one of us has one of these in our pockets that, you know, why not use this as, uh, as your deck of cards, as, you know, as a bingo card, as a spinner, as a slot machine, you know, there's a lot of really whimsical game designs that, that could be produced um, and facilitated with the aid of technology. Yeah, like Draft Mix. That's a game with cards where you mix music, um, but it uses your phone as the actual sure. like, instrument to play the music and like show all the visuals. And the other good thing is it's less cardboard in the box, which saves you money. Yes, it's true. Cardboard is heavy, and that's expensive. <laughs> um, so there's two areas that I'm really interested in like moving forward, and one is 3D printing and kind of giving the agency to the home user and player to print new pieces, print like add-ons and things for their board games, like especially for things like legacy games. Again, going back to that stuff in the box is expensive. It's not so bad if you just give them some digital files they can download and then they print the exact pieces they need for their crazy legacy game. You're welcome. Please steal that game idea and make it because I don't want to have to make it, but I want to play it. Um, I do. And then also RFID chips, especially in things like miniatures. Um, we started playing around with it a little bit ourselves, but we have not the technological know-how or engineering skills or electrical skills to really do it well. But like, think about having an RFE, like ID chip in the bottom of the base that you know, when you put it on certain areas of the board, it does stuff. Or like, what if you have like a little LED also in there, it can light shit up, especially like when you've got mages and crap. Like, there's cool things you can do with that. Save some ideas for the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> Stop talking. <laughs> So for for us, like I said, it's um, we already have been working on VR for two two or three years. So having the experience of actually incorporating the gameplay into VR is, is really intense because uh, a couple of things that we didn't even know that we'd find out as we were going, we didn't know we could stop you from hearing. Um, that was a unique and, and very scary moment. Uh, if I put enough information into the VR scene, you cannot hear. I tested this, and it's amazing. That's terrifying. It is terrifying. It's, it's even weirder when you're going, what do you mean there's no voiceover? Like, no, you forgot it. You didn't put the voiceover in there. Um, also, by putting something in, in right in front of your face, if there's enough elements around you, you can't see um, because you're scanning everywhere. And I think it's because of the newness of VR that we don't really know how to look yet in a VR scene. We kind of get overwhelmed, so we're like... Phew, phew, looking everywhere. So the gameplay is, a, is very basic in so far as it's an eye spy. You're looking for one item, but in that room, there are dinosaurs and there's aliens and there's giant flies and there's all this stuff that's overwhelming and things that could be right above your head, you're not going to look at them if there's someone in the corner slowly walking up to you. So the beauty of VR is not just, hey, it's VR and you can look around. It's like, holy shit, I can really screw with you. Um, and you've come here to be screwed with. You've come to this game to actually release and go, okay, this is different. Or, or the fact that if you're put on a plank, you're not going to move. You are not going to move. You're, you're, um, your brain is going to override everything and you're not going to do anything. So there's a lot of things that 
we can do that have never been done inside of a normal board game. And, and that's a true immersion into the board game. The other thing is the AR element, uh, none of our cards have text on them. So a lot of the things when you pick up the card, you're gonna find out what the card does and what the card does to you and what, uh, and what, the, um, what the good and bad of what that card does and also the chips. Um, there's an element in there where you see a scene and you have to basically get hacked. And the only way someone can know if you're hacked is to flip over the chip and then the AR comes up where you have a tentacle going through your robot body um, and like, okay, you're hacked. Um, but if you fool everybody, they're moving backwards and you're moving forward. So there's all of these things that VR and AR can do, but as game creators, you really have to think, how do they fit? You can't just add them in just for the sake of adding them in, because that's just a gimmick. So for us, it really was, what does this do to the gameplay and how, and how we uh, react to each other? So VR and AR is, is going to be huge, or it's gonna die because we all do shitty VR and AR. <laughs> that's the way that goes. Uh, I think the biggest innovation I've seen recently in uh, board games is that you can get people to pay $200 for them. <laughs> um, like, where the hell did that come from, you guys? Uh, my price points were $19.99. Um, and I'm, I mean that seriously because uh, the, the quality and the quantity and the... Um, the 3D-ness of the product that people are making now is extraordinary. Um, you know, Gloomhaven, I mean, what the hell. Um, it's got so much stuff in it. Uh, it's remarkable. Um, and I, I mean, obviously, you can just think about it and see all of the cool things you can do with it. Um, and I, I would say that like not a tenth of them have been done. The other follow-up to that is that you can get people to pay $200 for a board game and then tear up components of it. Right? And throw them away. Uh, okay. Um, you know, I, 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 the legacy technology, uh, I mean, the, the mindset is just amazing. Uh, in my day when we did that, we'd give people pads and they could write things on them. Nowadays, you take a damn sticker and cover some rules that no longer work. And that's just genius. Um, and it's the fact that someone actually had the guts to do it. Um, and they did it well enough that it worked. And I don't know what the next thing's going to be, but it'll probably involve many hundreds of dollars. <laughs> I would like to give a shout out to every miniature Kickstarter game that has over two hundred dollars pledge. Yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, I asked you all before this panel uh, if you are tasked with coming up with an innovative board game with no further instructions, what would your idea be? <laughs> Let's just go with first come, first serve. Uh oh. Dark guns. <laughs> you know, that's it. I, that, that's it. That's it. I, I, I like physical components in a, in a physical board game. It's one advantage you don't get from, um, you know, computers. Right. Physical components are great. Having a, you know, physical element in your board game automatically elevates it from the back. All those add on accessories to the Wii. Yes, exactly. Yes. I really want to build a 3D printed game. <laughs> Someone build it. What's this? The 3D printed legacy game. Oh my God. Where you I make money off this, though. I, you buy the files for me and like a subscription <laughs> access to a login where you get the stuff from. And then we change it up as a, like, you know, um, sort of seasonal content sort of package. So if you don't play, you miss out on it. <laughs> um, we actually, actually, I had a conversation about this, um, and and because we've just been diving into VR so much and and finding out what it does to the human mind, uh, we wanted to build a phobia game. I could I could see where this is going. Like, oh no, that is not cool. Uh, it's basically stay in your seat game. It's basically you win if you can stay in your seat. You're all you're all experience a phobia. And what's wild is I would say that that's real easy to fool yourself and go it's not it's not going to scare me. But I've had too many experiences um, where I I have to take the glasses off like the water's coming up slowly. Oh, and no. Like, no. Oh, so it's fun for the ten people oh. watching. You. Yeah, it is. It's no it is. fun at all. I think you. it might be more like a game show. <laughs> like, let's see what there's alligators in the room coming towards you. Can you stay in your seat? Um, but there's some crazy things with your mind that you can do with uh, 
with uh, VR, that might be cool. You, you pull out a deck, and here's this card, and you got alligators, and you're like, I pass. <laughs> I am giving that to you. <laughs> I'll take the next choice. Yeah, but there, if there are shots, I think that I can get behind that. Yeah, the drunker you get, the more fearless you get. <laughs> take a shot or, or yes. sit with alligators. <laughs> Yeah, um, I have to say that I just wanted to uh, invent games that have already been invented um, and get the credit for them. Like Arkham <laughs> Horror. Uh, I want to read you Arkham Horror because it's a fantastic product, uh, except someone already did it, which really pisses me off. Um, but that is the kind of thing that I would like to do is a nice cooperative kind of storytelling game. Um, maybe a little... Um, shorter and more and, and less painful than some of those games, uh, but the problem is if it's a short game, I'm not sure you can charge two hundred dollars for it. So, <laughs> oh, ye of yeah. little faith. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, I think I would just like to work on the storytelling stuff. Um, one of the games that I worked on very peripherally uh, in my youth um, was a game, Tales of the Arabian Nights. And what I mostly did on that was typeset it. Um, so it was already pretty much already done by the time I got to West End. But there are some storytelling elements in that that I think are just beautiful and brilliant. And I think they could be done um, better and with, with some of the new technology and the new price points. And I'd love to take a shot at that. All right. So uh, for people who are interested in starting to design their, their own games, uh, either trying to join a company or just make their own indie company. Uh, what kind of tips do you have for those kind of people? I mean, well, if they want to make games, and especially if they want to make board games, the beauty of it is that it is really accessible. Uh, you don't have to learn programming. You just have to learn how to cut things out of cardboard <laughs> and write on them. Uh, so that's you know that's beautifully liberating. I think there's probably a lot of um, actual like coding projects that you know if they had just made this game out of cardboard, they could have saved a lot of R and D and realized it was a terrible idea and then <laughs> threw it in the trash. Um, so that's yeah you know like the Nike commercials, just do it, just just make the game as fast as you can and see if it works. And if it doesn't, throw it in the trash. Uh, as far as you know, I think the second half of your question was well you know I have a good game already. You know, how do I get this in the hands of someone who could, you know, publish it? Um, conventions are, are great. These, these kinds of events are, are really good. Uh, trade shows. And uh, if you, you know, if you can uh, sell it yourself, if you can manage a website, a uh, shopping cart, even if you sell, you know, 20, 30, 40 copies, that's exposure. Uh, that can lead to bigger and better things. All of you who are already here are already halfway there because you guys are already at a game con. Yeah, it's true. And I played her game earlier today. Look at that exposure. Yeah, she made a game. Go play it. I'm going to say almost the exact same thing. Do you know what these are? These are index cards. You know what I carry around with me? Literally my purse? Index cards and dice. Because you know what this is? This is your game right here. You can make this thing into anything. You can shuffle this as a card. You can make tiles. You can make a die out of this. You can make standees. This is what you need to go buy stock in and purchase all these things. Um, it's absolutely just go make some stuff with paper and pencils and markers and stickers and whatever you have at your local Michaels. Like literally go walk up and down the shelves of Michaels and just buy random things. Like I have these sequins like glittery puff balls. I'm making a game about germs and aliens. Woo! I mean, it's like just go buy random stuff and get yourself a craft bin and start getting you some prototyping tools and just start making things. Document it. Make print-to-play files. Put them up a line. No one's going to steal your games or your ideas. Let other people play them. Uh, the more you make, the better you're going to get. You're not just born with this, I am a designer in ability. You only get better through practice. So go make some stuff. And as far as getting it in front of people, yeah, networking, conferences, Gen Con, go to Gen Con. Um, for Gateway, we tried to do a Kickstarter, and I will happily say it failed miserably. We ended up pulling it after one week due to a lot of personal issues with timing and stuff. We're like, we just can't do this. This was a poor, poor decision. But that one week it was up um, got people's attention who were important. Um, and then when Sean was at Comic-Con in San Diego a couple months later, one of the producers for Simon went up and was like, I saw your Kickstarter, and I'm very interested in the game you do you happen to have a prototype that I can look at right here? 
yes, I do. That started the actual relationship and talking points when we actually got the game published by them. Get your stuff made. Have copies of it around. Always be prepared to give that elevator pitch and to show someone how to play and to sit down and play with them. You never know when that moment is going to happen. Be prepared. Get some next cards. <laughs> I can say nothing better than everything she just said, <laughs> uh, so I'll go a different route. Um, <laughs> we did not make a game to make a game. Uh, we made a game to learn about VR. We actually needed a vehicle to learn more about it. What happened was I'm, um, my team is very creative, and they made something that stuck. And every time we did a game test with it, the people who played it were like, this is really cool. Like, when is it coming out? We're not making a game. <laughs> we just want to know about VR. <laughs> We're not really concerned. Yes, we wrote a good story, but our goal was never to make a game. Um, we went towards selling the game or pushing the game out there because people liked it. Uh, and it was like, oh, well, that's an added value. And we moved forward with that. So my big thing is... So, just so you know, I'm also a teacher. I've been teaching for like 25 years. Uh, so my big thing is if you learn something through the experience, you're, you're winning. So whenever we build anything at the studio, any R&D is about learning. Um, and the vehicle, we just choose a vehicle. Everybody liked board games, so we chose board games. If everybody liked freaking bocce ball, then that's what it would have been. Um, it, that's the only reason it was a board game. Um, we learned as we went, and then the game mechanics, uh, we, again, everybody plays, but I have no freaking clue about game mechanics. When you guys started talking, I'm like, get me the F out of here. God, don't say procedural again. I don't know what it means. It's just, it's making me nervous. It's a fancy word, but we're just making stuff up. It worked. <laughs> Um, but we ran as fast as we could through ideation. So the first game we built was Victoria Frankenstein. Got great reviews, got us an actual bigger project for something else. We're like, okay, we're done with that. Let's do something else. We made a game called Noir Alley, uh, Curse of the Owl. Not to sell or do anything, but just to, to form an idea of how VR could work in this space. Turner Classic Movies came in, let's have a meeting. Like, okay, we have this thing. Well, we're not ready yet, but keep going. All right, we're done with that. Let's move on again. Chimera's Rift. Um, so we just keep running and making and running and making, but what's happening through the whole pro process is the fourth thing we made, VR Voyager Outpost. Um, it, a reseller picked it up in, shit, eight hours. Um, it was because we did all of our knowledge um, or, or our learning of gameplay and mechanics and all of that stuff through ideation and just not getting stuck on it. Just going, this is good, people like it, we don't know what to do with it, done. <laughs> this is good, people like it, still don't have a freaking clue how this whole thing works. So yes, this is my first conference and, uh, and it's nice because I met some people to have further conversations with. Um, but through that learning process and just having fun, like actually going in there, um, I remember Chimera's Rift, I, I played it myself freaking 50 times by myself going, I am not a gamer. This is fun. <laughs> I wonder what this variable will do. I wonder what this will do. I wonder what this will do. Um, and it was falling in love with what you're doing. And I think, I, we did portfolio review um, yesterday, and I, and I had the same problem I have with every freaking portfolio review. And it's not the work. There was amazing work. It was that everybody had a concrete goal of what they wanted to be. Life don't give a shit about your goals, okay? Just so you know, it does not care. So have fun building what you're building. If you're building something cool, Get it to that point where you can show it to somebody else. It's amazing. Life will pick shit up and go, I'll take it forward for you. Um, that's just my experience. But I've seen a lot of people not make it because they get caught up in this one thing. I got to sell this. I got to get it to Kickstarter. I got to do this thing of monetization. Freaking make something good. Then worry about the monetization. Then worry about the Kickstarter stuff. And then let everybody in on it. Like you said, let everybody play. Let everybody talk. And everybody's opinion is important because that's your customer. Um, and that's your client, and that's the person. You're not making it for yourself. You're making it for somebody else. So you have to let go of all of that ego. That shit is getting in anybody's way if you have it. Um, and just and just build and have fun. So that's my two cents. You are a designer. I don't know what you keep saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
since I'm last, I have to make something up. Um, <laughs> I would say that the one thing that, that uh, I mean, I, I can just reiterate what everyone said, but I would point out that um, you have a pretty big uh, asset in your local um, game seller, particularly if they've got the uh, tables in the back for Magic the Gathering and various other things. Uh, you can friend up those guys and get them to, like, say, host a game night. Um, at Game Jam, even if you know, maybe if you want to go that way, but you can certainly go and talk to them and say, "Look, I've, I've got this game. I need some testers. Uh, you know, can we set up on a Thursday night?" And all those things. And uh, once you've got a game that's got a good product that, that works, then you can go on to the next thing. But the first thing is, you know, get people to look at it. Conventions are great. Uh, all of those things are great. Um, you know, find some friends. <laughs> Very useful. <laughs> I have a couple things to add uh, as to what I said and, and definitely what you said. Um, so uh, Flashpoint Fire Rescue, the reason it was picked up, uh, two things. Uh, one, uh, within a few months of, of me just selling it on the Game Crafter, which I, I yes. thought nobody had ever heard of before, but it actually sold like 42 copies. So um, some guy in Germany coded like Java Flashpoint. And then he came, you know, he emailed me and said, hey, can I just like put this up? And people can play it for free. And I'm like, this is really cool. Yes, do that. And then I use that as a, as a marketing tool. And, and I mean, it works pretty well. Um, the other thing uh, is that um, my game was found uh, by the publisher who ended up uh, printing it, uh, Indie Boards and Cards. Uh, not because I brought it before him, but before because the game was brought uh, to the Gathering of Friends uh, in New York. And I. I didn't bring it there. I still don't have an invitation. And I'm still waiting. <laughs> I guess I, I hey, haven't made it that big. Um, but your game. But is. my game was brought <laughs> to the gathering of friends, and several publishers played it, and they're like, "Oh yeah, this is really good." You know, we're going to reach out to the author. Um, totally out of the blue, but you know, if I hadn't put the game out there, none of this could have happened. Don't be afraid of failure. <laughs> So most of the people here are probably here for video games. How would you say that making board games is different from video games? <laughs> um, okay, I'll, I'll start, why not? Um, <laughs> it's very different in almost every way. Um, obviously the, the, the platform is very different. Um, the amount of commitment, the amount of play time is very different. Um, the objective of the player is often very different. Uh, video game is often, uh, you know, mostly uh, me against the world. I play by myself. Um, you know, maybe I play with other people online, those kind of things. But a board game is a communal activity, and, or at least it should be. Um, and therefore, the objectives are not only to make the game intrinsically fun, but also to encourage the interaction um, with the other players. Always let the other players do half the design work for you. Um, you know, give them a framework and they'll have fun. And, I mean, there are other things that I'm, you know, you go on and on about, um, like, you know, boxes of stuff. <laughs> you know, uh, if you can, you know, the, the, the feel of like a, a handful of toy soldiers is so different than a bunch of pixels on the screen. Um, that gives you an entirely different feeling, and that's what makes the board games great. Um, I think uh, speed of ideation and uh, completion of the board, like you said, with uh, the index cards, man, it's really fast. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done a lot of animations, a lot of 3D, and God, that takes forever. Uh, just waiting for stuff to render. And we have some really good illustrators and just uh, tasking them with, hey, um, this character, this character, this character we need, um, can you just change that, change that, uh, change the board, do this, do that. Um, and it's kind of something that you can, like for us, someone asked me, a lot of people have asked me, like, how long did it take? And I said, well, it took one day. And it's like, how did it take one day? I said, well, I was really fucking bored. <laughs> and I had a sliver of an idea. So I grabbed the co-creator and we just drove straight. And we just kept driving and just, it would do this. Now, nah, why would it do that? Well, because the, the big bad is there, it has to do that. Well, if it can't do that. And we basically drove for four hours, had the idea, and then drove four hours back, finalizing the idea, went to the studio, got out a big sheet of vellum and drew what the board was, 
then he drew what the board was, and I drew what the board was, and by the time it was you know, midnight, here's this board, and it's like, okay, and, and this is it, and we're done. Because we didn't, because of the, the nature of uh, not wanting the monetization, but just to learn, it was like, wow, we can actually start building this. It's true. Yeah, because it's like that, and if that was a, a computer game, or even an animation, there would have been just for us in, in our formulas, um, just to get an idea for animation is a month and a half just to get the idea because you're connecting all the bells and whistles and, yep. and you can't build this without breaking that and you can't do this because everything's connected. But breaking something in a board game is just like, oh, look at that. That was awesome. <laughs> I know, really right? <laughs> uh, but that's as simple as it is. And then, and then you go on, and someone comes in and says that's not good, and they rip another one. Like, oh, let's do it again. And I've, I, I never realized how freeing uh, designing that way could be because, again, I've never designed like that. It's always animation. And it's like, wow, this is, this is, you can get there way faster, and you can change way faster. And I think yeah. that's really neat. Um, I'm gonna build on that a bit and also be a wee bit contrarian because that's how I roll. So um, the end process and like the end goal of what you're trying to deliver is very, very drastically different. So like, you know, with a video game, if you want to add another unit or like add another virtual card, the actual physical cost or like, you know, resource cost of that, once you have all those systems in place, is relatively tiny. Like let's say you have like 700, 1,000 digital cards, you want to add one more, it's not that bad to get one more illustration or like another XML entry. It's not going to break your ship date. If you want to add one more card to a physical board game, that has real world physical repercussions, um, weight repercussions. Also think about when the, the way the physical printer works. There are sheets of paper that are a specific size and you can get only a specific number of cards on that sheet. If you want to put one more card in your game that goes over that sheet count, you pay for one more sheet. Even if you only use one tiny little piece of it way up here. That is not in easy decision to make. That is not an easy thing to balance for. Like, I really do need that one more card, but that now makes my game literally $3 more expensive. It makes the box an inch taller now to house all those extra things. Now what do I do? Like, I have to actually, like, take this as a much, like, harder problem than it would be in video games. Um, that being said, the actual process, design process of designing a video game and a board game, it's the exact same thing. It's the exact same skill set. It's not like if you're a board gamer, you can't be like design, you can't be a video game designer and vice versa, because guess what you're doing? Design, either way, it's the same thing. Um, the only thing that's different is speed and the iteration speed. So like with this super secret game or video game we're working on at Oxide, um, we're still not done getting all the base systems implemented in programming, because it's it's hard to do that and slow. I built a board game of the base systems for that for this game in two days, um, and then we started playtesting it immediately. And like you know, before we even sat down on a computer to start putting code, and we're like, are these even good ideas? We can test this in a physical medium and then transfer it over to digital once we've got a better idea if we like it or not. And that saves programmer time, that saves artist time, that saves your own design iteration time on the back end once you've got everything rolling. Do that. Okay, to add on to what was said, um, I, I think that the best games, uh, whether they're uh, board games or computer games, uh, the best ideas are very often the simplest. They, uh, they're elegant. Uh, everyone's like, you know, what a breath of fresh air. I, I totally understand this, you know, without you having to explain anything. I, I understand what this game is. Um, with that said, uh, you can tell when a, a board game or a card game is too complicated. You know, the, the players, you know, fur, furrow their brow and they kind of frown and they're like, man, I spent, you know, th five minutes trying to figure out how many points I should have picked up this turn. Uh, it, it becomes apparent very quickly when the players have to, like, calculate things uh, that you're, you have too many systems or too many subsystems, which you could always kind of fudge uh, with a, a computer that's handling, you know, a million calculations a second. You know, you don't even notice that. Um, you know, but your players notice if uh, your game is so complicated, they can't figure out what's going on from second to second. Um, so I feel like it's easier to cheat in some ways with, uh, you know, computers uh, versus a, a, a physical game where you feel every, the weight of every rule. 
I would like to add one more thing uh, that development, that iteration is can be a lot quicker because you just can make new cards, but the balancing is a lot more discreet. For video games, you can easily just like increase player speed by one half or a tenth if you need to, but if you're making a board game with a discrete grid, uh, it's a lot harder to make small changes to that because one more movement could mean so much more difference. And uh, I would like to close out uh, before we have uh, questions from the audience. Uh, why don't you all give a quick pitch for your favorite board game? Oh, that's mean. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, my favorite board game is the one that she's trying to sell. Um, Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, my second favorite board game is probably um, Diplomacy, which some of you may or may not have played. Um, and that is one, friendships. one of the most brutal uh, games you'll ever play. And it's best played at conventions with strangers <laughs> because you don't really care if they hate you at the end of it. Um, it is pure uh, negotiation and treachery. And if you haven't seen it, then you should probably look it up on YouTube or something uh, because it is an amazing product. Uh, I am not a board gamer, and I am not a gamer. Next. <laughs> I haven't heard of that game. Dude. I, I, everybody I work with is a gamer. I'm a storyteller. So that's my part. They actually give me the, the game, the way it's broken up, is way stations. I write the way stations. I write the plot. I write the meaning. They write the strategy. Have you played Once Upon a Time? It's a little card game that's only about yes. storytelling and crafting procedural stories. I use that word again. You said procedural. <laughs> <laughs> if you would have used another word, I probably would have. It's got images it. on it, like, you know, a princess or a dragon. I'm or in. Like a, yes. <laughs> and then you basically get dealt a hand of cards with pictures, and you have to craft a story. And it's a, it's a like, cooperative it competitive game. Once Upon a Time? I will pick that up. You That's my favorite game. game. <laughs> Once Upon a Time, the game... <laughs> Is a game that gives you cards that you're allowed to tell a story. You guys should check it out. <laughs> um, my favorite game changes frequently. It's mostly whatever I really like playing right now. And right now, that's role player. Oh my god, it's a um, yes, it's so good. I wish I had, it's one of those where you're like, I wish I had thought of this. It's amazing. So it basically takes the idea of rolling a character like for D and D and makes that the game. So it's one of those games that has like five. It's got like 80, 84 dice in it. So it's this massive bag of colored <laughs> dice. And so immediately you're just like, I want to roll out the dice. This is great. And then it's got all of these character sheets that have holes, like little perfectly square die cut holes that the little dice fit right into. So then the little OCD nature's like, I'm gonna put the dice everywhere. Everywhere. And there's patterns, like you have to match the colors to the class, and you want to get to certain like stat combinations because obviously a wizard needs a high intelligence and not a high strength. And it's got all of these crazy little you gotta try to match and like mix all these things using these dice. It's amazing. So good. Go buy it. That's my second favorite. That's <laughs> <laughs> the way she describes it. Uh, it probably says something that the games that I uh, play most often, the two uh, in particular, are just so diametrically different. We have um, Eclipse, which is you know a 4x strategy. I, I guess I just like these games uh, with you know you're in space and there's like aliens and you're in spaceships and you build your empire and you you know evolve, you know improve your technology. Um, everything is ramping up, you know, towards this you know huge conflict for the center of the galaxy. And I and I think I like that ramp up. That's why I like uh, you know Civilization, not the board game. The computer game. Uh, it kind of gives you that same feeling uh, over, well, shoot, it probably takes like five hours to play. The other game that I play uh, most often is called uh, Camel Up. You have uh, camels that go around a track. Uh, you gamble on which one's going to win, and they the, the camels jump on each other, little wooden bits, and then they, they kind of take each other for a free ride because camels are jerks. Uh, <laughs> the best thing about this game is that it takes 20 minutes. You can explain it to, like, your friends, your family, your neighbors, and everybody has a good time. So those are like, I, it, it, it's weird. My, my two favorite games are on like complete opposite ends of the spectrum as far as time commitment and complexity. Camel Cup also has a pyramid in the middle, which you use to roll the dice. It's a great little component. Again, physicality of components. I love, I love it. And my favorite game is called Millennium Blades. It's a collectible card game simulator where you play as players of a collectible card game. 
<laughs> and so there's a 20 minute tournament phase, no, uh, 20 minute real time coll collection phase where you buy, sell, and trade cards, which you use in a turn based tournament phase. And you do that three times to see who's the grand champion. It's basically playing through a season of Yu Gi Oh! <laughs> <laughs> All right, does anyone from the audience have any questions? Or favorite games we don't know about, we should know about. <laughs> Why don't you start with the front? Um, um. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Karen. Um, I have a board game, and I would like people to play it as well. Um, but my concern is um, balancing, like, uh, complexity. Like, a lot of board games, especially, like, the really big, huge $100 ones are, like, enthralling and amazing, but initially they're very complex. Like, how do you balance the bit of uh, intimidation that comes with like a complex game that is to start but may be fun to play once you get there um, as opposed to just like you know simple fun blast through it yada yada one of the things that uh, that I think uh, Gloomhaven does is it starts with a little tiny set of rules yeah. and after you've played it for a while then it starts adding in new rules <laughs> a lot of games these days are putting the rules on cards uh, and so your, the original instructions might be a couple of sheets, but then when you get dealt a card, it now changes the game in some way, and so you've now got an extra paragraph of rules. Um, so you can sort of roll them out that way. Another thing is to assume that if it's a style of game that's complicated, your players are going to put up with it. Um, and that's, I mean, you can get away with that to a certain bit. I have a friend who forces me to play Advanced Squad Leader uh, once a week. He's uh, not a friend. And, it's a, uh, and that has a rule set that's literally this thick. Um, oh, and it has little tiny chiclets that you have to try to see when you're old. Um, but that, I mean, there's no way to get around that. That's just the, the level of complexity for that game. But for uh, more mainstream type products, I think rolling out the the rules in bits is probably the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. And yes, that is absolutely true. Like onboard your rules and like pace them. Don't just throw everything at the player on turn one. That's horrible. Um, another thing you can do, what was I going to say? Brain just went blurp. I'm, I'll go ahead <laughs> on to that. <laughs> Not the blur part. Um, so when, when we started doing this, uh, because it's a story and stories are complex, we decided that uh, the story and the gameplay could actually be separated. Mm -hmm. So we built the way stations, and the way stations will give you mission objectives. So um, there's a mission objective just for this little space. So we don't try and give you the whole story and the whole set of rules. We're just getting you to another way station that has another mission objective. So we don't want you to know the rules. Mm -hmm. um, basically, it's the one, there's one rule, move forward. Um, you'll find out as you put your um, player on these on the VR chips because the VR chips hold a story. So it was interdispersed over a length of time. So by the end of it, then you're like, okay, this is what the game is. So whenever somebody says, hey, tell me about the rules, it's like, no, <laughs> we're not doing that. Because if I tell you everything, you're going to get glossy and, and you're going to not want to play. Um, the rules are move forward. Yeah. I remembered what it was. Um, it's while, especially games that are, have a lot of narrative and lore and world building, it's very um, attractive to create words and terms and new, like, you know, uh, vocabulary for all these concepts that fit into your world. Please don't do that. <laughs> if you have money, call it money or gold. <laughs> don't make up some word like, you know, the Hoobians, because then you have to teach vocabulary and concepts and constantly remember, what the heck was the Hoobians again? When you can be like, it's the money. Oh, yeah, I've got money. I've got five money. Yay. <laughs> so, like, you know, while theming some of the important words can can work, really keep in mind how much information you're asking the player to learn and track at the same time, especially if you don't. All right. Uh, I'm a big fan of modularity in games. Um, I tried to do this in uh, Flashpoint, where there's the family game rules, there's the full game rules. There's actually any number of, of variants in between, but... Um, uh, at some point, I realized that I didn't need all of the rules uh, that I had to play the game. I could I could play with these five systems and leave these five off the table. Uh, yes, they were fun, but they were maybe for more of a pro level player, someone with more more experience with board games. Uh, so, for a first time player, or you know, you're introducing this to um, a young person or someone who's their idea of a board game is, oh, you mean like you know, Clue and Monopoly? Okay, start them off with the family game rules. 
uh, that you know they won't be playing with the specialist characters. Uh, they won't be playing with the hotspots that ramp things up. They won't be playing with hazardous materials or the you know little fire truck that runs around the board. Yes, those things are cool, but they add complexity. Mm -hmm. So those kinds of uh, players who aren't ready for it, um, they're going to appreciate it so much more when they play the game the simple way. Mm -hmm. And then you can add these these elements in yeah. one at a time, just kind of uh, lead them out of the darkness and into the promised land of <laughs> real board games. Magic Maze does that really well. Like, it, yeah, because it starts you off with just like a very tiny little rule set, and they actually in the rule book have like this is the order you play these games, and you add these rules and add these tiles in in this exact order, and it makes the game way more interesting and fun and complex. But it is super complex by the time you get to like scenario 18. You're like, oh, I can't do this anymore. But if you would start on scenario 18, you never would have wanted to play the game ever again. <laughs> um, so that's another game you should check out. It's awesome. Magic Maze. Yeah. Thank you. So one of the key differences uh, that you actually touched on a little bit was that between video or uh, one of the key differences between video games and board games or tabletop in general is that tabletop is generally enjoyed in a more social setting. Um, what are tips that designers can implement into their tabletop games if they want to connect with the players emotionally or, or somehow make connections between the players? Maybe you want the player to feel empathetic or sad in certain situations. How do you do that in a, in a more social setting? So something that I, I normally get, I don't get a chance to talk about this. Um, Chimera's Rift uh, was, is based on depression. It's actually based on fighting depression. Um, when the idea came up, it was we had some downtime at work, and I, and I suffer from depression. Um, and it was basically the only way I've ever been able to solve it is to make something. Um, so what happens, the adversary in this, even though it's in this dimensional creature, um, it, is, it is the feeling of being alone. Um, this creature wants, wants to destroy the world because it wants to be alone. And your job is to stop this creature. It's basically, if you don't stop this creature, you're alone forever. That's it. It's done. Um, but we put it in all these sci-fi elements to that. Um, uh, we knew we had something when I make people cry. <laughs> we knew. And the funny thing is there's, there's a barometer of knowing that. So we hit on different levels. So I'm 48 years old. The guys I work with are in their 20s. No one's over 25. Um, they haven't encountered the emotional things that you encounter over time. So when they play, they play a game and they play the, the strategy. But the amazing thing is uh, I've played with a couple of people who've gone through divorce and they immediately know what the game is and they cry. So this is what I say to the guys. If I were to make a game, you need someone at different age brackets mm -hmm. to be involved in your game. And this is not to say anything to you young guys and women. Um, uh, as you go through age, you go through suffering and you go through empathy and you actually know what the hell's going on in your, in your mind and you know why things happen because you meet more and more and more experiences and you get more and more open as you get older. You need an old dude. You need an old woman. You need someone in there to go, this is what it feels like. Yeah. Um, and you have to be so responsive in that gameplay for me because, again, because I'm not a gamer, I think I had a, an unfair advantage of watching people play and watching the human experience as opposed to this, the strategy if it was working. Um, to see someone quiver when they had to tell a story or something going, wow, they're uncomfortable in their own skin. How do we make them more comfortable telling this story? Uh, when we started the game, the players were uh, people, uh, and we changed the players to be virtual reality avatars, and it was amazing the change in the game because then they didn't have to talk as people, and they could actually tell a story from a, a third point of view almost. So you have to become an observer of people. Um, you have to actually wonder why someone did something and be objective, like your opinions, are not the reality. Um, you have to be objective and what do you feel and wh what's going on. Um, uh, my son is a co-creator uh, and he's jaded as F. Um, he's like strategy, strategy, strategy. And I wanted to mess with him. So I added an element that I knew talked to him but it was part of the strategy. So I'm telling him what I added and we're having a beer at our, our favorite uh, bar and he does the one tier thing yeah. and I'm like, Except you fuck. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, it's the lost child. 
Yeah. It's, it's not the, the player isn't called the lost child in no way, for, in shape or form, but in storytelling, it was like, this is the character that has all the power but gets defined by how it's treated. And this character can be good or this character can be bad, depending on the players and how they play this character. But it was the environment that happens to a person and why someone is like this and someone is like that. So get yourself an old person who's been through a divorce, a fire, <laughs> a layoff, has wandered the earth. <laughs> this is a really weird classified ad. <laughs> yeah. Get yourself that person because they will add empathy into your system, mm -hmm. into whatever your game is. You are absolutely right. So I did my MFA project on crafting emotions and players through game mechanics and you nailed it. Like you were far more brief than I was. Too, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's about finding those shared universal experiences that you can tap into and draw on because you can't create sadness unless there's that personal attachment that you're drawing a memory from. Because if you like, they're like, I'm a parent, so you can like hit my buttons very easily with certain very mm -hmm. simple things. And the other parent will respond in a very similar way. The non-parents, eh. like, go play that dragon cancer. I can barely talk about it without bawling. I'm going to stop talking now because I'm literally going to start crying. Go play that. Because like it's fun. No. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, it, obviously, if you're creating a social game, then the most important element is do the players have a reason and a motivation uh, to interact with each other? And that That's just so obvious, so I'll, so I'll move on. Um, game, which is very near and dear to my heart, um, I played it well before I had ever seen the TV show, uh, Battlestar Galactica. Uh, what it does uh, so well uh, is that it makes you dependent on all the players around you and who are all putting uh, cards into a pile and then they get shuffled and then they get revealed and then somebody's a Cylon. Who was it? Was it you? Were you a Cylon? It, it, it captures the essence of what the show is, which is paranoia. Uh, and, it, and it does that marvelous, marvelously because all of the mechanics center around, you know, circle around, like, somebody is, is screwing us over. Who is it? I want to put them in the, I want to, I want to shoot them out an airlock. Give me a reason to distrust you. Um, so you had to be, just show some consideration for, like, what kind of emotion. Uh, obviously, it could have been a very different sort of game if, if all the mechanics were uh, cooperative or just trying to help each other. Completely different game, completely different emotional context. Uh, so, you know, find that emotional context. What, what is it you want to feel? Uh, for Flashpoint, obviously, I, I kind of want people to feel just the sense of, like, creeping dread and panic as the fire, like, you know, completely encircled them. It's like, there is no escape. I, I want them to feel, like, as near as possible, I mean, not literally terrified, but, um, yeah, I want them to feel like, you know, this, this, this is hopeless. How, how am I going to get out of this? Uh, I want to be a, a little afraid for themselves, and um, yeah, I started with that emotional context, and I built the mechanics around it. Thank you. One last thing on that. Also take into account, some people don't want those emotions. Yes. And they are going to be really upset through some of this gameplay. I found I was surprised going, wow, that doesn't affect me, but that affects you. So you got to be careful um, of what emotion you're going for. Uh, it might hit really close to home for some people. All right, I think we have time for one more. <laughs> um, so earlier, you uh, brought up uh, talking about um, like taking a video game and prototyping it with a board game. Uh, I was wondering if you could elaborate more on the process of like taking a video game, breaking it down into a board game, and then using that prototype, uh, taking the revisions and building it back into a video game. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's, it's snippy. But um, so like really, what are systems of rules and mechanics, but systems of rules and mechanics? If you have a map in your video game, make a map. If the map's procedural and random, Make some tiles and boop, 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 deal them out. Is it going to be the exact same algorithm? Probably not, but you can start to actually model some of that in paper that you would have done um, in the computer. Uh, do you have virtual cards in your game? Here they are. Actually craft them, actually write them. Um, do you have character creator? 
That's great. You play D and D. You've got a character creator. Just get yourself some pencil and some papers. Get some dice. The dice are great. Um, and actually start to like just write the systems out that way. I mean, really, a lot of the video game mechanics are literally the same thing. Just you know, take the graphics out and use words and colored markers. Don't worry about you drawing icons or anything. Just write attack in words. It's a lot faster. Um, yeah, you're not going to be able to model literally everything, especially stuff that involves AI um, and like really complex calculations. That's fine. Um, you can hand wave some of that or I literally have a calculator next to you. Like, yes, I, this is what needs to happen. That's fine. It doesn't need to be perfect. Um, if you need to do hidden information, ta-da, you can't see what I have anymore. Yay. Um, so just get creative. And like, yeah, it's you're never going to get it perfectly, but you can nail a lot of the base feeling that you want mm -hmm. that way. I know for a fact there's this game, um, Mario and Rabbids uh, Kingdom Battle. It's it's a you know it's not a Nintendo Switch. It's a kind of an XCOM light yes. game. If you know what that means, it means you you know tactical fighters moving around a map, shooting stuff, and hiding behind cover. Uh, that was prototyped as a board game. Yeah. Like there you can you can see the pictures. You know it's it's all on blogs. Just I'm not making this up. They uh, they people at Ubisoft. They made a board game first. Um, you know, they had just a grid because that's what they knew they'd be using. They had, you know, this this is going to be our cover. This, you know, this rocks our cover. Um, and then the little, you know, stand-up figurines, uh, maybe just plastic army men. Okay. Uh, and they just, you know, iterated on this is this is what an XCOM-like game is. Uh, we're going to do things a little bit different. Oh wait, that didn't work. Let's do it a little different again. Okay, this is better. Um, and it seems, you know, at first glance, it may seem like counterproductive. Like I didn't, I, I, my goal was not to create a board game. I, I always meant to create a video game. So this is just taking time away from that project. Well, no, because if you had started like coding on day one, uh, you know, you have this plan in your mind, but your plan is going to change. If you can get it out on pencil and paper, uh, iterate on that idea, uh, fail faster, you'll learn what works and what doesn't, and you'll be able to apply that going forward. And then you can start to code, and then you can actually build the thing. And this time, it will actually work. One of the things that you can do always is have yourself as the AI. That's true. Um, in that you can have someone else playing the game, and you can be behind the scenes making the decisions for uh, the opposition, you know, as though it were a D&D &D game or anything mm -hmm. else. Um, and while you're doing that, you can in fact be constructing the AI or at least the outlines by trying to see what kind of decisions you're making while you're playing and what are the things you're considering. Um, and that's very helpful as well. It's true. Legos are also awesome because you can like, you know, actually craft stuff and do destructible terrain, all these other stuff. You're like literally like chuck it down on the table and see how it explodes and if that was fun or not and like how that would affect things like cover. Like to play with the stuff you have in your basement and like it in your attic, like get out your old toys. You're like, woohoo! So this applies for both board games and video games. Uh, figure out what the core of your game is and isolate it and just ask yourself, is this fun by itself? And if it is, then great. It'll be more fun when you add more stuff to, to expand that mechanic. Here was a question that was asked about rules. And I want, can I just answer that? Yeah, sure. Okay, so has anybody watched uh, The Toys That Made Us? on Netflix, if you haven't, everybody needs to be watching that because it will give you uh, the inspiration you need when things are tough. But there was a, a great uh, story about He-Man, and since He-Man was a character that nobody knew and they launched the same time as Star Wars, their fear was that no one would actually pick up on He-Man. So they went and they made a comic book. And the whole thing was, it was just a one, um, one comic book, but it just kind of gave the origin of He-Man. And that was a huge thing. Uh, and I, again, I don't know enough about games to know if that they're doing this, but why can't there just be a comic book in your game um, that you read this comic book that kind of at least gives you the origin story so you know all the players? And yes, don't name things weird shit, um, because that'll just make a bad comic book in a bad game. Um, but you can get all of your lore out in a really quick way uh, in a graphic way that might even get people willing to play even more so. So if the rules are complicated, they're like, all right, I kind of like these characters and I kind of like this world already. So you get your buy-in because if you have buy-in, people will do the work to get past the complication, the complicated parts. So again, I don't know if 
games are already doing that, but some are. It's 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 a good idea. A lot of people are using this kind of graphic um, introductions in order to get people hooked. It's a good idea. Do we have any more questions? I saw this one first. So uh, I have a two-parter. One, go to the dollar store for any rapid prototyping stuff. Michael sucks. They're too expensive. <laughs> two, um, I was going to ask, especially Michelle, I know you're great at spreadsheets. How do you find balance in your testing uh, when you're testing board game mechanics, and how do you take what you see in play testing and apply that and change the formula and tweak that? You want to see the gateway spreadsheets? They exist. They're up on Google Drive. Like, this isn't just for video games. We have all the cards in a big old spreadsheet, and there's little numbers assigned to them, and you can, like, fuss with the numbers, because we, we, the thing is, like, oh, we don't like to make random numbers, because you're, like, you're just throwing darts at a wall, then a lot of these things are controlled through algorithms, even though it's a physical card, those numbers came from somewhere. So, yeah, we have that old model in the spreadsheet, just like with a video game. She's so when, terrifying. She is terrifying on, on the set. She's great. <laughs> uh, when you're testing, uh, do you actually have your computer there while you're watching yes. the testing and you're saying, Making okay, we can make changes plus live. five so magic great of, about this too. Yes. Get Sharpie. Yeah. That's broken. Now it's a two instead of a one. Let's keep playing. Awesome. Thank you. You can find, actually, um, just a, another shameless plug for Michelle, she did a... Um, a seminar earlier on using Excel to create monster uh, yeah. generators, um, and there are a lot of really cool tricks that you can use Excel for. So look for it um, in the GDC. Sorry, the, the Siege. Um, Wouldn't that be lovely? Yes, look for it. <laughs> look for it in the Siege um, reports on, on things that occurred and on, on talks, and you'll see a lot of really good ideas about uh, how to use Excel. So my question is kind of towards all of y'all. Uh, what elements that are in board game design that y'all would like to see in video games and vice versa? Um, I think, you know, more human interaction. And you're beginning to see that a lot in video games. Um, but, the, you know, the, the, um, the, the way that in a board game you can, you know, do stuff cooperatively or... Um, competitively and get the reaction from the person sitting next to you, who may never be your friend again, but you can, I mean, also maybe they can be. Um, I, I don't, I'm not sure what else I can say about that. Um, so I do play one video game. So I play Bioshock religiously um, over and over again because there's no other game that I've come in, into connection with that that is that rich in storytelling. Um, the problem that I have with video games is I, I there's not enough storytelling and there's not enough layering for me. Um, there's not enough mystery for a lot of the games that I've tried to play. Everybody always gives me a game and I go, okay, I'm going to play this and I'm going to get what I need. And it's like, it's, it's the thought pattern that happens after reading a book. So like when I read a book, there's, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the people and what's going to happen next. Um, and Bioshock had that for me because they had these little tapes and all this other stuff like, what the what does this even mean? And is it going to come up? And do I care about this? And all of that stuff. And you guys can offer some good games because I don't know. I've, I've just been suggested stuff that I'm like, this isn't it. Um, so I would love to see uh, in video games um, this hybrid storytelling apparatus that could happen where um, it's not something I'm doing in 13 hours. It's something that uh, kind of like a, a season of Game of Thrones or something that it's, okay, here's this world that maybe even I'm only allowed to be there for an hour. Um, and I have to get this amount of information. I think there's a, uh, what's happening in broad, so I'm, I'm from the broadcast world. So I've been in broadcast for 25 years and it's dying. Yeah, that's a fact. Um, but um, the broadcast being a passive entertainment thing and video games being this interaction, there is this in between world I don't think anybody's done it successfully yet, but I, I think it can be done. Um, so I'm patiently waiting and even trying to be in that space. But I think that's the next thing for all, um, all media is to take every little component that we have and not keep them separated and isolated and try and find this cohesiveness to them. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm excited someone to break that uh, barrier. So, I would like to answer this with a question from the audience. How many of you have played TF2 or Overwatch or something, and you just find someone, and they're just crouching up and down rapidly? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, with video games, 
uh, it's a lot harder to have like the same interactions of feelings since the people aren't right in front of them. Uh, so basically, I found that uh, the best emotion that can be conveyed is uh, just doing silly things like that. My World of Warcraft experience was that. I stand. I stood in the middle of a, of a field, going, "What the hell? <laughs> what do I do now?" Get shot, murdered by other players. That's what happened. Yeah. <laughs> I do think one of the things that uh, computers can offer uh, board games, uh, more so than the reverse, is that uh, they offer the potential to hide information from other players, which has been a really real problem. I, I like the idea of like a you know spy fiction type game with lots of intrigue and mystery. Uh, it's very hard to do when you need you know one player knows this, but you know other players don't know this and. Uh, that is complex. Uh, if you could move that information into an app, which only displays that information to select players, I think that would, you know, that's amazing. There's like new genres of board game that could be created from that uh, alone. Uh, as far as computers being, uh, computer games being more like board games, um, obviously I, I wish the social component was more there. Uh, there's lots of silly things happening in games like Fortnite. There's, you know, Nothing very, you know, serious or heartbreaking. I, I think no. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, maybe maybe VR is the answer, but um, I don't know. We're not there yet. Um, I agree with Paul that like, we're getting there. This, this man is taking us there. <laughs> that um, one of the biggest things that board games has over video games is that um, that social interaction, and, like just finding those emergent social dynamics and patterns, and just the experience of watching the visceral hatred on Paul's face when I do some dick-ass maneuver to him and some game we're playing. Like when we play Guild Wars 2 together in like our offices, which are right next door to each other, it doesn't have that same feel. When I just scream at him through the wall, and I do scream at him through the wall, but it's I don't get to see his face as he's like. Oh, in response, I can just hear him like banging, and that's about it. I'm terrible at Guild Wars, <laughs> and so mainly she's pissed because I keep dying, and she's got to wait for me to, to show up again at the damn respawn point and catch up with her. <laughs> yeah, that's part that's of that. A that that's yes, that is a with another conversation. Um, and the other part that board games have over against, I wish we could solve, and it's, it's a hard problem to solve, which is why it's a thing, um, is that when you have a board game, you you now have agency over everything in that board game. You don't like that card? Guess what you can do? Chuck it. You want to change that rule? Guess what you can do? Change it. Right then, right there. House rules. Like, you play Monopoly, free parking, that ain't a rule. You people all made that shit up. That's not another rule book. And you can do that. In a video game, that's a hell of a lot harder. Yeah, yes. some, some video games allow for modding, but even then, there's now this barrier to entry. You have to be able to code. You have to understand how the game systems work. Maybe you have to even be an artist to change some of this stuff. That is so hard to overcome, and I think we'll get there, or at least um, we'll have tools later to help with some of that. But just you know, taking that very innate experience, like, I don't like this piece. I don't want everyone to play things. I think it's overpowered. Everyone agree? Great. Having that kind of just ability to reauthor the experience as the player in a video game would be so freaking powerful and awesome. Sure. Go do that. I want to play that. Uh, I think that's all the time we have, right? Yeah. To close out, I'd like to add one last thing that VR is doing uh, is doing great for social gaming because uh, you can see people wave their hands around or move their head, and it's a lot more natural than talking to just like avatars who just walk around with the same animation. <laughs>